Hi, everyone. Sorry for the delay. I have a few problems logging, logging on. Um, I've done a little presentation, which I will go through. I apologize. It's fairly lengthy. Um, but I'll, I'll skip through some, some of the details so that we've got time to have a, a decent conversation. So I will just try and share my screen. Um, share. Can you see this okay? Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. Okay, so brilliant. So I'm going to talk about COVID and the immunosuppressed. And when I mean immunosuppressed, I'm really focusing on, on kidney transplantation because that's what I, I that's the group that I mainly look after. But I think it's pertinent to to any immunosuppression, um, kidney or not. So vasculitis treatment, rheumatoid arthritis treatment. Um, as well as those who've got a lower immune system because they've got poor kidney function as well. But I'm mainly basing it around transplantation, and that's certainly where we've had a lot more information coming through. So the reason it's worth talking about, as you very well know, is that with um, transplantation, you have a... Um, immunosuppression medication, which dampens down your immune system, these T cells and B cells that you will have heard about. And, and that's vitally important to help prevent uh, rejection of your transplanted organ. That's what we need to happen to keep the transplant safe and functioning well. Um, but these T cells and B cells also are our main way of, of fighting infection. And, and so hence you have a vulnerability to in, infection. Um, and then, of course, diabetes, heart disease, obesity um, are all really common in kidney disease. And these also increase your vulnerability um, to COVID-19. So I'm going to base my talk around these three main areas of trying to look at how we can live with COVID and hopefully provide a little bit of reassurance that, that we're further on than we were 18 months ago. So I was concentrate on non-pharmacological interventions um, primarily, um, as well as pharmacological prevention. And then I'll just talk a little bit about um, updates in treatments for people who do develop COVID. So starting with non-pharmacological interventions, well, these are ones um, to help reduce your um, development of COVID, so to reduce the transmission of COVID. And we know that COVID is transmitted by droplet um, infection, um, and hence the hands face space that came in quite quickly with COVID. So these liquid particles, when we cough, when we sneeze, when we speak, when we shout, when we sing, um, come out of our, of our mouths and settle on onto whatever surface. And, and so we need to wash our hands and, and cover our face and stay greater than a meter or ideally two meters to avoid those. But more recently um, in May, the WHO confirmed that COVID is also airborne um, spread, which are tiny, tiny particles that, that hang around in the atmosphere. So if you think of those specks of dust that you see in the sunlight hanging around, um, in the air. It's a little bit like that, so it can stay around for some time. And so therefore that brings in another dimension of improving ventilation to, to clear these particles. And that's just a little diagram to um, highlight that. So the droplets are the larger particles which will settle on the ground or surfaces. And these aerosol droplets are really tiny and can be in a suspension in the atmosphere, really. This is something that um, was in a Spanish newspaper, I think nearly a year ago, but I think it's a really good um, depiction of how to understand how, how COVID is um, spread. And so 
I think I think the article is called a bar, a classroom, and I can't remember what what the other one is, but it talks you through the spread. So just looking in a in a living area here, imagine that patient actually has COVID um, at twelve o'clock in a, in a room with um, five other people. And if after four hours without any safety measures, most all of those patients, in fact, will have been um, uh, infected. However, um, on the next slide, on, on the right here, if, if people are using face masks, then actually only four of those patients would be infected. And then to take it a, a few steps further, keeping the windows open so there's ventilation and reducing the amount of time so it's at two o'clock now instead of four o'clock actually only the one person who's the nearest would have been in, infected so these are real simple easy to undertake measures um, to uh, reduce your risk and it's why there's there's a lot of talk at the moment about ventilation in, in classrooms to try and, and reduce risk um, and so the WHO updated their sort of hands face space to think about uh, being outside, staying um, at a distance from people, but also for the shortest length of time, particularly when you have to be inside. Just to quickly to go through masks, um, which mask should you wear? Well, I think one of the first things to say is that masks protect the people around you rather than you yourself because those droplets um, can still get through. So a homemade mask certainly is helping others rather than yourself. It's catching their coughs and, and sneezes and, and, and large droplets. A surgical mask, particularly if it's tight fitting around the nose, will go some way to protect yourself from, from large droplets. Um, coughs and sneezes, but not from those air, airborne, very, very small particles. And really to get the best um, coverage from a mask, the FFP2 mask, which we only use in a ICU setting, um, are, are the ones that are required. So I think that just to highlight that it's really the other people around you that need to be wearing a mask to protect you, which I know goes some way in conflict with, with the government announcements, but I think things that you can do is um, wear certainly a surgical mask and even have a homemade mask over the top just to add to your own protection. So a homemade plus surgical would be my recommendation, FFP3 if you can get them, but um, I, I'm not sure that they're so easily available. Next thing is about shielding, and as you're all are too well familiar, shielding uh, has been uh, a necessity at several times over the last um, 18 months. So why is that effective? Well, it's the ultimate non-pharmacological intervention. It's removing you away completely from um, risk. So does it make a difference? Absolutely, yes. And certainly our local data in Salford um, does, does show that, and I will show you some data. But what I think is important from our local data is that the national picture, the updates that you hear on, online daily as to the total number of cases, don't tell the local picture. And particularly in the Northwest, we've had um, waves of COVID um, before other areas in the country have had it. So um, the, this was a wave in Greater Manchester. And if you actually look, yes, we shielded um, early on really quickly. And this is the S1 on the graph. Um, and then it, S2, when you were asked to shield, actually that was past the peak for Greater Manchester. Um, and then again, uh, in, in S3, the third time you've been asked to shield, um, well, we were just at, at the peak. 
And actually, the, these are our cases of COVID in, in Salford patients from March to March. You can see that October um, was our highest month for cases. So if I just um, go back, you can see that the peak time here uh, is reflected in our transplant population. So looking at what's happening locally, I think is much more relevant than, than the national picture. Um, so that's just saying the same thing. The UK data doesn't always represent what's happening on your doorstep. And if you look at the uh, waves of, of COVID in Chelsea, um, it's very different to the picture in, in Bolton, which, which is a key area that, that we serve. Um, and, and I would recommend looking at local data to make any, any decisions. These, I think, are really helpful sites to, to get that local data. I look at it daily. Um, it shows you maps of your local area and you can really drum down into detail. To, and now at the moment, everywhere has a very similar pre prevalence in, in the north of England. But there's times where you can see hot spots that you may choose to, to avoid. Um, and I, I certainly like looking at those graphs. So moving on to pharmacological prevention, well, vaccination is, is the key thing here. And um, the, the whole transplant community um, nationally have had a high uptake of vaccination and, and quite rightly as, as a hopefully an opportunity to improve um, the outlook for the future. So just briefly what we aim to do by vaccination is stimulate your B cells and T cells specifically um, for that virus that, that we want to prevent. So vaccination for flu does the same thing each year. It stimulates your B cells um, to produce antibodies um, which will stop you the virus getting into cells and T cells, memory cells to to really go into attack if they notice that virus um, uh, becoming um, in, infected with it. And there's a number of viruses, um, uh, sorry, a number of vaccines available, as you well know. So Moderna and Pfizer um, are an mRNA vaccine. So these are just the different vehicles that are used to get the, to get the, um, to stimulate the antibody production. Um, so mRNA disappears almost immediately after you've had, had the vaccination. The Oxford AstraZeneca uses um, a viral vector um, to, bring, to bring the um, uh, antibodies into you through, um, through the vaccine and then the Novavax, which isn't yet available, but hopefully will be later this year, is just a, a viral subparticle used to stimulate the immune response. And it's been important to have two doses of vaccine because the first dose will give you a, a primary immune response. Um, and then the second dose gives you a heightened response. So, so greater antibodies and for longer period of time. And as you know now, uh, we'll be looking into it to um, uh, a third dose. But even after having the dose, it's still important to wear a mask as you could still have, um, have COVID even after vaccination. And I think there was something out just in the last 24 hours that said that the vaccination for the Delta virus reduces your, your risk of, of transmitting by 50%, but still there is that risk of transmitting. And I'm certainly aware of cases that has been transmitted from immunocompetent vaccinated people to transplant recipients um, despite vaccination. So masks should still absolutely have a role. So the key question has always been how effective is the vaccine for people taking immunosuppression? And lots of groups have been looking at this nationally and internationally. Um, the first data that, that came out was American data 
um, which showed that about 54% of the transplant community developed antibodies after two doses of vaccine, which is clearly less than the general population. But the flip side is that that's 54% who wouldn't have had antibodies now do have antibodies. So, so whilst disappointing, it's not the same as the general population, some encouragement that antibodies can be produced and, and are for just slightly more than half of the transplant population. But what that did show, and, and this, is, this is just to remind me, don't worry about, about the details, is, is that that antibody level, that threshold is, is less again, than um, someone with, with who are not taking immunosuppression. Um, but if you do mount antibodies after the first dose, then you'll get even bigger antibodies after the second dose. But in general, that is less than, than the general population. And so it figures that perhaps the, those antibodies won't stay around as long as the general population, but we don't have that data yet. So looking at our Salford data, as, as many of you know, we, we have checked antibodies, some as part of a study, but the data that I'm presenting is just our, our routine data in that we've been monitoring antibodies in our transplant and dialysis population, um, uh, certainly since the start of, of this year. For some, we managed to um, get antibodies checked prior to vaccine, but the majority it's been after uh, vaccination. And we got similar data to um, uh, the American data. So we found about 57% of our population have developed antibodies after two doses. Um, but we, what we don't have is an indication of high, ha, how high those, those antibody levels are. We didn't find a difference between the AstraZeneca and, and the Pfizer vaccine in terms of antibodies, um, but we did notice that different immunosuppression affected whether people developed antibodies. So it stands to reason the less immunosuppression you're on, so people who are just on one immunosuppression tablet are more chance of developing antibodies. But with caution there, often that is for a reason and, and, and it doesn't therefore mean that people should just be on, on one um, immunosuppressant agent because obviously people need to be on more, more than one for many different reasons. Um, we found that MMF um, was more associated with, with um, not developing antibodies, but again, it's a very important drug and um, at this moment in time, we would recommend absolutely carrying on, on with that. Um, and I don't think that will change in the future. We also noticed that those with better renal function were more likely to develop antibodies. And again, that goes back to the lower immune system with a lower level of kidney function. Now, there are some risks with vaccination. Um, some mild to moderate symptoms many people will have had. And then the risk of the vaccine induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, which was associated particularly with the AstraZeneca vaccine um, was, was noted, but extremely rare. And, and since then, obviously the, that vaccine has been advised to not be given to under 40 year olds. Other side effects that have been noticed with the Pfizer vaccine is some inflammation in the heart muscle, uh, particularly in younger people, but that's felt to be self-limiting uh, and not causing long-term issues. So that's the antibody um, data, but what happens in a lab is very different to what happens in practice. And measuring one antibody is, on, is only part of the picture, as I've talked about, T cells are also very important. Um, data from um, NHSBT looked at all the transplant population who've had vaccination um, since the beginning of December. And as you can see, big numbers there receiving vaccination. This isn't just kidney transplantation, but any, any organ transplantation. 
And they found, um, and I think this is data up to the end of May, that um, prior to any vaccination, um, the cases were about 7% of the population, but then after the first dose went down to 0.8% of the population. And then after two doses was down at 0.2% of the transplant population. So given good indication that the vaccine is um, effective. And again, looking at Salford data, um, these are the cases that who've had COVID since the double vaccination. So we've had 24 cases since um, people have had two vaccines. Um, in, I think it's at seven, in the grey bar, we didn't know um, their antibody status. They hadn't had a blood test prior. Two patients did have positive antibodies. So despite having positive antibodies, they still developed COVID. And um, 14 patients had no antibodies. Two of those actually didn't have the vaccine, which was quite rare. We had 98% uptake in vaccination in, in our population. So yes, you, you can still get COVID. Um, but actually, you can see if you're developing antibodies, that's there's a lot less number are developing COVID. So, so um, reassuring that antibodies are protective. Um, and I think we need to watch and wait whether no antibodies um, also show some protection. From the national data in NHSBT, um, I think it's quite encouraging. Obviously, new variants come along, and the Delta variant is the one that's with us at the moment. Um, but further variants are highly likely to happen um, until there's worldwide vaccination. Um, and so we need to always be looking at whether our vaccines are covering those variants, and likely different vaccines will be developed over time and require further boosters over time. In France, they've actually given three doses of vaccine. Um, and this is data from their paper that says by giving a third dose, they do really push their antibody level. So they had um, about 40% antibodies um, after two doses and then once they had three doses, they were nearly at 70%. I think it was 66% antibodies um, after three doses of vaccine. So hence why it's um, recommended to get the booster when that comes available. Obviously, it's a different dosing schedule in the UK. So again, our own local data will help inform how, how that affects the antibody levels. So the UK booster vaccine is available from the 5th of September, according to the JCVI. And um, as clinically extremely vulnerable people on immunosuppression, you'll all be invited for a booster dose. Um, and you will be the first priority. Um, and then second stage will actually be household contacts of immunosuppression of immunosuppressed individuals. So um, I think that's really important to know. I'm not sure how well GP records are at picking out household members. So do keep, keep abreast of the news and when stage two are being invited for vaccination, do badger um, your local vaccination centers, GPs to, for family members to be vaccinated. And now there's a number of research studies um, ongoing in prevention of um, COVID. And in Salford, we're hoping to be able to recruit into the, the PROTECT study, um, hopefully later this month. And that's a study of taking um, prophylactic nasal niclosamide. So prophylactic meaning to take it before getting disease. Nasal means it's a, it's a nasal spray, no spray. And niclosamide is actually a treatment for tapeworms. Um, but this has been found to reduce the risk of transmission 
of COVID, it acts by being a nasal spray at the point of entry of the virus. It's minimally absorbed. And the PROTECT study is recruiting patients on dialysis, transplant patients and vasculitis patients who are on immunosuppression. Um, so I think that many um, centres around the UK are recruiting on this and hopefully we'll be able to recruit on this by the end of the month. So moving on now to um, treatment of COVID, um, pharmacological measures and non-pharmacological measures. So the most important thing if you think you have COVID is, is to get a test and also to contact your healthcare team. So at Salford, we really would like you to contact our transplant nursing team on the usual numbers. We may recommend changes to your treatment. Often we recommend holding MMF just for the duration of infection, but um, we weigh up your, the rest of your immunosuppression to see if we need to change anything else at the same time. The other really important thing is to let your GP know if you test positive. And that's because as being clinically extremely vulnerable, you can be referred um, for a service called oximetry at home, which I'll, I'll mention on the next slide. Um, but if in doubt, always do call 111 or attend the emergency department. And research studies are showing new treatments com coming forward for, for anyone with COVID. So oximetry at home. It, it's, a, it's a home monitoring system for patients who have symptoms of COVID and it's to pick up any early deterioration in the first 14 days of illness. And so essentially it's monitoring your well-being and it's monitoring your oxygen saturation. So you, you can be supplied with an oxygen um, saturation monitor. You can also get, get one off Amazon or, or other shops will do um, to monitor oxygen levels and the what comes with the team is advice on red flags what to do if your oxygen level is this um, and advice of how to monitor your oxygen levels as well as calls to to check in um, how are your symptoms compared to the day before and and how are things progressing and certainly I have had patients who have gone to hospital I believe earlier than they would have because they've had that monitoring so I think it's really important GPs can refer into it um, local A&Es can refer in, into it and, and across the region there's there's oximetry at home um, and if you live in the Salford area we can refer to our local service but we do we do need the help of GPs to to um, refer in when you're out of the Salford area. So these are the treatments that have come down the line from for COVID over the last 18 months, dexamethasone, which is a high dose steroid um, for anyone who's needing oxygen treatment. Tocilizumab is given, and that's a rheumatoid arthritis treatment for those who are severely unwell. And again, in the next few weeks, hopefully, um, there's going to be new specific monoclonal antibody treatment likely to be approved for use for people like yourselves who, who might not have COVID antibodies who develop COVID. And I am, the protocol isn't out yet, but I understand that could be for mild to moderate disease that wouldn't normally present to hospital. So do watch the news, watch this space for um, updates on where that treatment will, will be placed. And research is, is, is um, continuing in the recovery study that, that brought about dexamethasone and tocilizumab, drugs used in, in diabetes, in psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis are all being looked at now as to how effective they are um, in improving um, management of COVID. So how do we stay safe as lockdown eases? Um, or has eased for, for many. I think you have to weigh up your personal, your medical risk, as well as your own risk tolerance. Everybody's different in how they perceive risk and also the circumstances involved. 
So some people, even within the transplant community, are higher risk than others. And one thing I would say that I was really surprised about with our antibody data is out of, um, I think, 200 patients, uh, we had 33 with COVID antibodies prior to vaccination who had no idea that had COVID at all. So, so that's 33 people without any symptoms um, had had COVID o- over the year prior. Um, so you can be you can be well even though you've had a transplant. Um, and there's certain things that mean that you're higher risk. The level of immunosuppression that you're on different different ethnic minorities diabetes heart disease and older age uh, and obviously thrown into that now is is whether you're you've developed antibodies to vaccination but looking at that personal risk tolerance um i went white water rafting in zimbabwe many many years ago and that's the highest risk thing i've ever done i'm not a risk taker but um, many people are, and many people's view of, of risk is different to another person's, and it is so personal. And I know that from the conversations I've had in my transplant clinic, uh, uh, people's different view about the amount of risk you're willing to, to accept. And um, on, on this diagram here, those in the red, you'd class as people who are risk takers more likely to to take risks more likely to uh, jump out of a plane for charity or abseil or or whatever. And and those in in the green will will stay very safe. And I'm certainly more more towards that side, but that doesn't mean that that's the right thing to do. Um, But having some awareness of it, I think is is useful to be aware of what risks you're choosing. And then obviously the circumstances involved, everyone's had really difficult choices to make um, and some choices you can't make if if you've got children in in different schools, if you have to get public transport to work, um, if you work in in an area with the general public, um, as well as all family uh, commitments, it is really difficult. But I think these, these are the basics wear a mask and ask others around you to do the same to meet outdoors where possible and if it's indoors keep it to a minimum amount of time keep the windows open um, in in whichever indoor space that you're in I think lateral flows are really useful I I think there's more and more evidence showing that that showing that they're accurate and certainly um, if I'm meeting my uh, parents or parents-in-law I I do a lateral flow and get my children to do the same beforehand ensuring your close contacts are vaccinated if it's possible I think is essential and keeping up to date with the boosters as I say they will be in the second wave to to have a booster and then get your own booster vaccine when that's offered to you and um with that as well, it is likely you will be offered a flu vaccine at the same time. And there is a lot of concern in the medical um, settings that this could be a bad flu year. And that's because those non-pharmacological interventions, those barriers like masks are, are being taken away now. So, so do take the flu vaccine up at the same time. It's likely you'd be offered it together. And just to point out that the JCVI does recommend vaccination for those 12 to 17 who are living with an immunosuppressed person. So, again, for, for it's been so difficult with, with schools, as you know. So, so having children in, in the house, they should be offered a vaccine. And it may be that you need to speak to your GP to get that offered. I think that's been offered as of now, but it, it may not be till autumn. I've not heard heard specifically. So do get your bubbles um, vaccinated with a booster or your children um, given the vaccine for the first time. And that's just a little bit to remind me to mention about the lateral flows, which are the ones on the right. You can all get those um, online 
ordered uh, packs of seven and you get a good indication of whether you have symptomatic or infectious COVID. Obviously, if you have symptoms, you need to do a PCR test. This is essentially just looking at some of the things I've talked to you about, the, the activities that are safer than others. So if you're outside with very few people, it's probably safe to, to be singing outside and wearing masks if you're outdoors. But if you're in a poorly ventilated room, and it, particularly if there's lots of people, um, it's higher risk. Um, if you're doing it for a longer time period, then again, the risk increases. Um, and if you're not wearing masks, the risks increase again. This is America, an American publication. So it, it's got a lot of American terminology, but it, it's trying to put together um, different levels of risk with, with activities. So grocery shopping, playing golf is probably quite low risk, going for a walk or a bike ride. Whereas going to a sports stadium, a music concert, to the cinema is classed as higher risk. And it can just give you a cross-reference of some of the activities that, that you're um, thinking about doing. It's going to be an anxious time. Um, our psychologist advises that you should expect to feel anxious, set yourself small challenges and go at your own speed. Do something little and often and preferably something that you know you're going to enjoy. Just be aware of any catastrophic thoughts and think about mindfulness exercises, breathing exercises to help. But make sure you, you talk about it, it to others, how you're feeling, but know that that's normal. Um, so our knowledge is improving all the time about COVID. We know that vaccination is effective in those who are being suppressed, but not as effective as the general population. Um, do get the vaccine, do get the booster and encourage everyone around you to do the same and choose those greener activities and take time for your mental health. And happy to answer any questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Rachel. That was really informative. Um, and it's given me some ideas of how to make my own risk assessment a bit more um, relevant. Thank you. No problem. Um, we have one question um, in the chat from John, and it goes back to Francis's um, decision to give three vaccines. And John, John's asking, did France give three vaccines to everyone or just the extremely vulnerable? I'm not certain on that, John. I, I think it was the extremely vulnerable and the elderly, I think, but I'm not absolutely certain. Okay. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the questions that were submitted, or do you think you've um, covered them? Um, I've possibly covered them, but if you just remind me, um, one question was, even if you don't have antibodies, have you still got some protection? And I don't think we know for certain. The NHSBT data suggests that um, we do. The Octave study is not out in publication yet, but I have seen some of their data and they do have similar antibody prevalence to us. So um, I think perhaps a little bit higher. I think it might be 57, 58% antibodies. Um, but again, they're not showing a great T cell response. Actually, they showed a difference between the Oxford vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine with Pfizer vaccine faring better. Um, now, um, we didn't see that and, and I, don't, I don't know why, why that difference would, would be. Um, so I think time will tell. I think there is some protection, um, but I can't categorically say, say that. 
And remind me, uh, the other there was a question about vaccination and how that's going to happen. And certainly in Salford, as many of you know, we, we were lucky to have a vaccine hub on site and we are planning to um, contact all transplant patients and offer them a vaccine from the 5th of September. Um, we don't yet know which vaccine it will be, but we believe it will be Pfizer or Moderna um, and you're likely to be contacted um, I did ask our pharmacist if we could also look at, at, at supporting family members being vaccinated and I'd quite like to, to look to support the 12 to 17 year olds as, as um, you know, that won't be easy, easy for, for, the, for them. Uh, so I hope we can, but it all has to be weighed up with who, our other priorities for, for vaccination as, as well. And obviously some people are much more comfortable going somewhere closer to home. Um, okay. And what was the other question, um, Rob? Can you remind me? I think I've probably covered it. I, th I think you have covered it, actually. Um, Pauline's posted that uh, you questioned the availability of FF3, FFP2 masks. Mm -hmm. um, they are available, and she's purchased them last week from Amazon. All oh, right, good old Amazon. Well done, yes. Pauline. Um, and an another question here. Um, Will the booster include the Delta variant? I'm not quite sure what that means. Uh, so I think the Delta is pretty well served by, um, by the Pfizer vaccine, Moderna vaccine, less so the Oxford vaccine. Um, <coughs> and, and so, yes, because I, I think it will be Pfizer or, or Moderna that you get. And particularly if the, the London data is suggesting that, that Pfizer um, fared better than, than the Oxford vaccine. Uh, I would hope that would be the case. Okay. Uh, anyone else got any questions you'd like to put to Rachel? Well, I don't, I don't know if this one's for Rachel or for you, but those two websites actually had on a, a PowerPoint is there any chance you can put them on the website so that other people can access them, please? I'll, I'll have a go, yeah. I can try and put the links on Facebook as well, John. I think they're useful. I look at them um, every day for, the, for an update um, and, and look at the graphs. And I think it's really helpful to make your informed decision. I only hope that the government continue to report that data because that's, I think, is really useful for helping make an informed choice. And I, I did hear, hear a rumour they may not continue to update the, the cases as, as we go in, into autumn, winter. The other thing I would flag to, to look at is independent SAGE. I don't know if, ever, if you've ever gone on to their um, seminars. So they do, I think it's 1.30 on a Friday, but it could be a little bit earlier. Um, they do a briefing and they make sense of the week's data. Um, it's on YouTube and it's on their Twitter channel as well. Um, you will recognize many faces on there because they've been popping up on the news on um, over the last 18 months. And they're supposedly apolitical. They're, they're not reporting to the government and, and they make sense of the data, I, I think, in a very knowledgeable way. And certainly just last week's had really pertinent questions about what should I be doing if, if I've got no antibodies? What should I be doing if I live in a multi-generational house and how do we keep safe? And there's people far more expert than me there answering those questions. So I tune in every week to try and understand the data and they're a little bit puzzled why the cases are coming down so quickly at the moment. So um, hopefully over the next week or two, the, they'll have an update of what, what they think is happening there. Alison, you were going to ask a question earlier. Yeah, I've actually I've put a couple in the chat. Um, so yeah, a couple of questions. Um, so first of all, will the monoclonal antibodies that you talked about being um, possibly allowed or you know um, suggested are they a preventative or are they a treatment? Um, so the. It's a treatment for mild to moderate COVID, I think is what it will be licensed mm -hmm. for, but, but we haven't got that through yet, but that's what I, where I think it will sit. 
mild to moderate for those without antibodies. Okay. And also, of the of your um, transplant patients who've had COVID, have they lost kidney function as a result? Uh, that was the other question that we got through. Um, so we haven't studied it, and I think that's a really good thing to study, and obviously we'll need to monitor it with time. We've had some patients who've developed an acute kidney injury that has recovered, and, and that might have been related to a, a dehydration. Of what we have seen in, in the transplant population is more gastrointestinal upset, so diarrhea and vomiting related to COVID, as well as additional infection. So we have seen some deterioration in renal function that's recovered. I would also say very early on, I saw more cases in transplant patients who had very poor kidney, fa kidney function. So actually we're starting that preparation back onto dialysis and I suspect it hastened going back onto dialysis. But, but for the rest, um, other than a very short limiting acute kidney injury, I've not seen it, but time will tell whether there's a, a long-term effect. And certainly that would be an important thing to measure, but I've not seen that and not heard others report it either. There's this one further question in the, um, the chat. Uh, if your first two vaccinations were AstraZeneca, will the booster be Pfizer? I think you covered that suggesting that if it's at Salford, it will be the Pfizer or the Moderna? Yeah, I'm not absolutely certain. And I, I checked with, with Liz, our pharmacist, and, and she doesn't know as yet, but thinks it's likely to be um, Pfizer or Moderna. Okay. Sarah? I've got a couple of questions in the... Um... I've got a 14 year old daughter and you're saying that I should be able to have her get her vaccinated soon. And I'm, I'm the transplanted patient. Mm -hmm. Is there anywhere that I can guide my GPs to if they don't do it? It's just that I tried to get my 18 year old daughter done when they said I could. And my GP came back saying it's only carers that could have it. In um, so partly I'm expecting a fight with my GP surgery. <laughs> um. So I think um, the JCBI recommendations are, are available on the government website. So if, if you type that in, JCVI children immunosuppressed, um, I think you'll get their, their um, recommendation there. What I don't know is, has that been given the green light to go ahead now or whether that's uh, in September? I've, I've lost track of where we're up to uh, with, yeah. with vaccination. So, but I think it'd be worth having that com conversation now. Um, certainly, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not certain. I've not heard from GPs yet that they're doing it, but I think it's worth an ask. Yeah, It'd be nice yeah. to get them vaccinated before going back to school. Absolutely. I, I'd be making a strong case for that. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is there any, you, you were saying about ventilation and things like that. Is there any guidance on perhaps a better place to sit in the room? I know it sounds silly, but she'd be sat in a school room well, all day with different, she's going into um, GCSEs now, so with different people potentially. Um, so I'm really trying to look how I can guide. She, she does everything to protect me. Yeah. Is there any advice I can give her to help take some pressure off her? It's really hard, isn't it? And, and I would put that to the school and right. say, what, what are you doing about ventilation in, in your classrooms to keep children safe? I think um, ideally there would be a standard and, and in New York, there's a website you can go on and see every classroom's ventilation standard. And in Belgium, I think every room, not just schools, but pubs, restaurants, clubs have to show a sensor as to their um, ventilation, their carbon monoxide levels. And you can't allow people in if it's over a certain level. And, It'd be nice to think that in the UK, we could move to a standard ventilation, a bit like our food standards, 
um, rating that we also get a ventilation rating. But in terms of for, for your daughter, I think it's really hard for her individually. And I'd be asking the school, what, what is their plan from a ventilation point of view? Yeah, OK. They, they obviously, well, she, she's been wearing the mask, but I know the silly thing is it protects others and not her. So we might have to look at getting a better mask. So mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Mm. possibly sitting near the door if if that's open and shutting a lot or if there's windows sitting near there but I think that really just creates the stream of ventilation through the room so just having that there I think is ideal right okay um right no that's fine that's fine thank you for that thanks Sarah any more questions Alison? Sorry, I've got another one here. Um, obviously, as it immunosuppressed, we've always been more vulnerable to, to everything going round. And I'm trying to weigh up how much more vulnerable, you know, what, what sort of level does it need to settle down to before we will probably only be about as vulnerable as we were before? If, does, that, does that make sense? It's kind of... How, how risky out there is it for us in reality? I know what you mean, and and I can't I can't put a definite answer to that. Um, I can only look at our cases and the graph of our cases compared to the the cases of coronavirus in the community, and and when the cases are low locally, I think it's reasonably safe um but when they're surging as they did last october and as they've done in in june july that's when i would pull back a bit and 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 really stick to those green places if you can and i know not everyone can yeah it, it is tricky um and it, it's trying to find a balance like you said personally isn't it which is is what i'm trying to gauge i mean i've pretty much more or less been shielding throughout so you know as much as I can do um mm -hmm. it's how much I risk getting back out there and how yeah what what the the long-term effects of going out and potentially getting it is it, it is really tricky and and one of my patients she wouldn't mind me saying she's probably one of my highest risk patients I've got she's gone out every day every day since the start of March without wearing a mask and you know she's she's fine but you just don't know yeah well thank you thank you very much for um your time so really no problem happy to I'm happy to answer any questions if you ever pop onto uh onto Facebook or, or Twitter I can do my best to answer them obviously a lot of this is my opinion and making sense of the data. So um, uh, just bear that in mind. Um, my thanks to RTI phone, but she, you're probably too busy to have a look. She's put on the chat a link to the website and the advice to vaccinate children 19 and under uh, brilliant. valid from today. Yes, exactly. So from today, all 16, 17 year olds, regardless of whether you've anyone immunosuppressed in the household, um, but age 12 upwards for if you have immunosuppressed. You're very welcome. OK, if we have no more questions, um, I'd like to just thank Rachel again for that. It was uh, very thorough, very comprehensive. And I'm, 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 I'm pleased we've managed to overcome some of the technical issues at the start. My pleasure. Thank you all very much for joining. All right. Take care. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for organising it, Rob. Thank you. No, bye. No, bye. Thank you.